Good morning, everybody. OK, so the screen's showing the right thing now. Um, I'm very glad to be here for two reasons. Um, it's nice to be back to give you an update on um, the reality, really, as it says, and, and future outlook after a talk I gave a few years ago on the preparation. And the other reason I'm pleased to be here uh, is because it proves that the scientists were correct. We haven't destroyed the, the universe. Um, of course, on the other hand, if you believe in the many worlds interpretation, given that there's a 50-50 chance either we will or we won't destroy the universe, perhaps we just live in half of the, the worlds where we, we didn't, and the other half have, have just poofed and disappeared. But anyway, I'm glad to be here, um, be able to, to give this, this update. And really, that's what I'll try and, and cover. Um, talk a little bit back about the preparation that we did to, to give a context for the update, uh, talk about the reality of some of the experiences that we have, and then give some future outlook based on where I, th I think we'll be developing the things that we've, we've done or modifying the things that we've done based on our experience, and then have a typical summary conclusion slide at the end. Um, but I would like to, again, give some sort of introduction to, to CERN and the experiments, uh, I'm not sure how many of you, I know a couple of people did see the previous talk, um, but I think there are some interesting things to, to talk about. And anyway, it'll relax me and you know, stop me being so worried about the presentation. So the first is racetrack on the planet. Um, this is, everybody knows, we're whizzing these things around at almost the speed of light, so nothing faster at the moment on the Earth. Um, the emptiest space in the solar system, now this is actually interesting because you really don't want the particles going around to hit anything else in the beam line. They, you want them to interact in the experiments. And we say here that there will be 10 times more atmosphere uh, on the moon than there will be in the LHC. Now, I'm not sh quite sure if we've got to the, the 10 times more or 10 times less in the LHC at the moment. Because one of the interesting problems that the accelerator has had over the, the past few months is something that they call UFOs. And I think that's unidentified falling or, or floating objects, where the beam has actually hit particles in, um, in the beam pipe. And this has led to sort of radiation going outside being detected. And the, the accelerator then thinks that something is going wrong and dumps the, the beam. And I'll come back to that. Uh, so, you know, we really do need a high vacuum um, in, and one of the worries for the accelerated people at the moment is that they haven't got the vacuum quite enough or there's a few bits of, of dust floating around. So the accelerator is performing well, but there's certainly, you know, scope for improvement in some of the, the times there. The other point then is we claim to be one of the coldest places in the universe. Now this is based on the fact that we're running the accelerator at 1.9 Kelvin, which is less than the 3 Kelvin background radiation. Uh, but again, like the, volume, uh, like the vacuum, this isn't done for you know, purely to gain bragging rights and say we're one of the coldest places in the universe. It's for a, a real reason. Uh, we have something like 1,300 magnets that are used to control and steer the beam in the accelerator. And some of these are 15 meters long, and you need to maintain the, the superconductivity in those magnets and make sure that there is a very even temperature. And for this, you need the properties of superfluid liquid helium, which is why we call it to, to 2 Kelvin. Um, so the superfluid properties that we have are the, you know, the really excellent thermal conductivity of superfluid helium. So it guarantees that if there is any temperature um, rise in a small point, it's quickly evened out and uh, refrigerated away. And then if you have these 15 meter long magnets, you need to make sure that it's all cooled and the superfluid properties of liquid helium where it creeps anywhere are quite essential for that as well. Um, and obviously I think the, well I hope many of you, are, I guess many of you will have heard of the problems that we had in 2008 when we started, uh, where there was a problem with the um, a breakdown in the superconductivity. Now this wasn't in one of the main magnets, it was one, in one of the interconnections between the magnets uh, where some resistance that was supposed to be nano-ohms was actually hundreds of nano-ohms. Um, so something gradually heated up there and the superconductivity broke down. Um, the problem then was exacerbated because there was a the design fault that we're dealing with now which is restricting our energy. Um, they planned, of course, to have a failure of the superconducting system. And then the current, the, the massive currents that we have are supposed to jump out into 
plane normally conducting um, copper bus bars for a while. Uh, the problem was that, or the, one of the design problems that we've seen is that those copper bus bars aren't big enough to hold the currents for the length of time that we need. Uh, so we actually have to put big copper clamps on either side of these connections now to provide extra conductivity in case of superconducting failure. Uh, and this is the, the thing which is now restricting us to running only at 3.5 TeV, not the design energy of, of 7. So we have to shut down in 2012 to, to fix that. Um, but in the meanwhile, we're certainly still one of the coldest places in the universe, and it's really to make sure that the, the magnets stay superconducting. Um, hottest spots in the galaxy, this is because we you know, have these collisions, it compresses the energy into a really tiny uh, zone. The, here it says 100 million times hotter, 1,000 million times hotter than the heart of the sun in a minuscule space. Um, this week we started colliding lead ions rather than um, protons, so now we've exceeded uh, the energy of the relativistic heavy ion collider in, in Brookhaven. Um, just as we exceeded the energy of, of Fermilab uh, for the proton collisions. And so this is really quite exciting now to see the, from the computing side the extra data rates that we're getting from these extra collision tracks. Uh, another interesting point on the, the heavy iron part is um, people may know that they collide gold at RIC, and so they say that we're cheapskates at CERN for just colliding lead. Um, in fact, the lead that we collide is isotopically pure and costs more than their gold. So, uh. <laughs> okay, um, so to understand these collisions, we then need these big detectors, um, these huge um, 100 million megapixel, well, anyway, I'm exaggerating that, these 100 million channel detectors uh, which generate the data that we have, really quite massive instruments. Um, if you go, you can't actually visit the caverns now, um, but the best time to see them was when they looked a bit like this, when they were open and you could see parts in the cavern. Uh, now you can't really see very much if you go down that. So why are we doing it? Um, well, pure curiosity, generally, intellectual curiosity. We have this remarkably good understanding of how the, the universe works and fits together, which has a model of, will this work? Uh, can I get a pointer? Yeah. Um, you have these leptons and quarks, which are the, the matter particles and the force particles that, that bind them together. And this standard model of particle physics works amazingly well. Um, I guess many of you will read the XKCD comics. There was one a couple of weeks back about economics and saying that you, know, you can tell this works because people are exploiting it um, to deliver the electronic operations that you see around us, spintronics, things like that. Um, unlike uh, homeopathy or anything else where the military aren't exploiting this. Does anybody remember seeing that comic? Hands up if you do. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, this stuff really works. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of things that we don't know, which is why um, particles have mass. Uh, the you can see that there are heavier particles that are down here, so they, they have more mass, but why and what is mass? Uh, this is one of the things that we want to see um, and try and understand. The other point is that we have um, these, force, these particles of matter and force particles. Now, the difference between particles of matter and force particles is a property called their spin. Um, matter particles have half integer spin, force particles have integer spin. Now, there's a model which gives a partner to each one of these, so an integer spin partner for the, the particles, a sparticle, and a gauge eno with a half integer spin partner of the, of the force particles. Now, one of these must be stable, and it must have a mass, and so that could be something which is contributing to the missing mass that astronomers see in galaxies. So studying uh, the supersymmetry at CERN is something which might shed light on the universe, we hope. Uh, then, of course, we have matter and antimatter. Why do we only live in a universe full of matter? Why don't we see equal amounts of, of antimatter? That's one of the things we'll be studying. And the heavy iron collisions, these are aimed to understand if you can have a sort of quark-gluon plasma and avoid having the, the quarks and, and gluons uh, concentrated into protons and, and neutrons as we see today. So these are the, 
sort of four real reasons why we, we want to understand uh, or we want to do these, uh, these collisions. Also, we develop new technologies along the way. Um, the web, of course, is one that's always mentioned. Another one is touchscreen um, technology. So the iPad uh, that's on offer here uses touchscreen technology. This was developed for accelerator controls back in the 70s. And medicine uh, is a big beneficiary of a lot of the detectors that we have. And there are more particle accelerators in hospitals than there are in high-energy physics labs uh, around the world today. Bring people together, lots of nationalities at CERN, um, amazing range of, of cultures, it's really very interesting. And of course, the people come through CERN and this is what our member states like, they learn about technologies and then they go off and apply them in, uh, in their local economies. Which is a good plea for science funding you know, in this uh, technology and this economy that we have, problems we have today. Okay, coming to a little more about what we actually want to do, here's a picture of one of our detectors. Um, we call this one the, the compact muon solenoid. I'll get to that in a, in a little while. Uh, but you can see that it might be compact, in, or might be called compact, but it's bigger than the office building that the, uh, that the physicists work in. This is, on the other hand, the Atlas detector in situ, where you can see zooming into the accelerator area by Lake Geneva between the Jura Mountains and, and the lake. Um, you can see the scale of the, the facility there. This is our campus. We're looking at the Atlas Pit, which has a nice mural by an American artist on those buildings now, by the way. The cavern, which was really interesting, uh, to build that, the engineering challenge, they had to put the roof in before the walls were there, so they had to support the roof um, from the the above to make sure it didn't collapse on the accelerator. Here's the experiment with somebody walking through it. Uh, and we'll pull back in a while to, to give you the sense of the scale of the detector there. So Atlas is significantly bigger than CMS. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we call CMS compact. Uh, the other interesting point about that is if you shrunk wrapped CMS and dunked it in Lake Geneva, it would sink. If you shrunk wrapped Atlas and dunked it in Lake Geneva, it would float. Um, so you know, Atlas is lighter than water, CMS is heavier than water if you take them overall. So CMS is very dense and, and compact. So these experiments are built to study the collisions uh, that are produced in the LHC, which builds on the chain of accelerators that we have in the past. Uh, this is one of the advantages of building the LHC at, at CERN, one of the disadvantages of the SSC because they had to build this infrastructure. Um, you can't accelerate particles from a standing start to the LHC energies in one go. You have to go through multiple uh, stages, and this is what's done at CERN. And then we collide them and produce these pictures in, um, in the accelerators. Now, this starts to touch on the, the computing challenge, because already to reconstruct the, the tracks that you see here from the um, digital images that you see in the detector, takes a lot of computing power. So you start to see how we, we need the, the computing power for, for this to reconstruct these images, figure out where particles went, how much energy they had, um, and then you need still more compute power to analyze millions of these pictures and figure out subtle properties in the events um, that we're starting to see now. Um, the LHC experiments have really, over the past six months, recreated, rediscovered all of the physics that was discovered in the past um, at CERN, at Fermilab, at SLAC. Uh, we have a very good understanding now of the way the detectors work, and we're starting to see new effects. Um, so CMS, for example, saw something which looks like um, maybe it's an indication of the, the quark-gluon plasma uh, new effect there. And so you know, we're really on the verge now of discovering new physics, and I hope we, we get that. There are four experiments to do different jobs. So Alice is there to study heavy iron physics. So it's really, their physicists are excited now that we've started the heavy iron model. We have Atlas and CMS that I've talked about uh, to do general purpose physics. And LHCB is a more specialized experiment to understand this asymmetry between matter and antimatter, um, CP violation. This is something which was proposed by Andrei Sakharov um, back in the, the 50s or 60s as the reason why you know, all of the antimatter that was created in the Big Bang disappeared because it annihilated um, with almost all of the matter. And we live in the remnants of the matter that was uh, left over from that annihilation. So these experiments generate huge amounts of data, as I've said. 
Um, we have something like 40 million collisions a second in the heart of the detector. Um, and these are then reduced to get a few hundred good events per second. Now, this again starts to touch on some of the things I'll cover in the, the talk, but a lot of the talk and the, the challenges that we had in terms of the preparation were only dealing with the challenges once we had these few hundred good events a second. Uh, we didn't really talk about the challenges in computing that exist to whittle down the experiment, um, the 40 million events per second, into the interesting ones that you see. There's a lot of computing challenge around that um, that I won't talk about. But con on the offline, we have the issue then, that we, we thought in 2007, we'd be recording data at 100 to um, megabytes to around a, a gigabyte a second. In actual fact, as I'll show later, we're recording data to tape at something like five gigabytes a second um, in peaks. Uh, average is more like two and a half. And rather than the 15 petabytes a year that we were predicting in 2007, um, the current forecast, based on the, the data rate that we've taken this year, at the low efficiency the accelerator was running at over the year, if we forget, if we imagine it will be running at the, the rate it was a, a week ago throughout next year, as is planned, um, we're looking at more like recording 25 petabytes a, a year. Uh, so we'll need a tenth of an exabyte of data in a couple of years' time in our robots. Fortunately, tapes have got more um, voluminous in the past few years as well, so we have enough space for that, so that's good. And for those of you that can't see the underlying event there, uh, this is what it looks like, a Higgs particle decaying to the form muons there in the CMS detector. So again, this is what we'd have to do to unwind um, the collisions that we have and look for the underlying signal where you have many, many overlapping events, and this takes the, the processing power. And this processing power is distributed uh, around the world. Um, we have about a third of the capacity at CERN, about a third at 10 tier one centers. Uh, so there's Fermilab and Brookhaven are the two tier one centers in the US. Um, now the tier one centers are important because they have a role for long-term data curation. Uh, so the, all of the data that we have, there is one copy at CERN and one copy spread out around the world at these tier one centers. So if we have any problem um, losing tapes or whatever, we can recover the data from the tier one centers. The tier two centers, these are large universities. Um, there's around 130 of them, and they contribute also around a third of the computing capacity, uh, but mostly for simulation and end user analysis. They don't have any role storing data long term. Now, this is a PowerPoint presentation of the data going out from CERN and uh, also being exchanged between the Tier 1 centers and the Tier 2 centers. This, on the other hand, is a uh, Google Earth-based monitoring system that we've developed that shows it happening. Um, this isn't in real time. This is something that I downloaded uh, yesterday and to avoid any demonstration effect problems today. But if I had the network connection, it would be updating uh, and you can see the, the transfer lines change. So the lines that you can see zipping across the Atlantic there um, and also across the Pacific around the other way, one went that way, those are jobs which are going out to different centers around the, the world. Uh, there are also data transfers that you won't be able to see, um, little dots rather than lines, and you can see the data which has been transferred around the world. Now, here it says that something like six and a half um, gigabytes a second of data are being transferred uh, when we did that. So, you know, we are transmitting large volumes of data and large numbers of running jobs around the world um, from this monitoring display. So, it's not just in PowerPoint graphics that we, uh, we can do this. Okay, so what were the challenges in 2007? Well, then, for those that were there who maybe remember, I talked about four areas of uh, challenges that we had. Providing the CPU capacity that we needed, um, managing the large number of boxes, um, large at least for us, maybe not on our Google scale, but certainly large for, for us. Uh, data management and distribution, uh, coming back to the, the problems there, how do we ship um, petabytes of data around the world and around CERN? and then understanding what was going on. So the capacity provision, um, this was the, the grid that we'd used. And already in 2007, um, people thought that we'd done pretty well in terms of producing the, the world's largest scale computing grid. 
Uh, and I think that's definitely true today. Um, there are certainly not any computing grids that are used on the scale of the LHC computing grid, uh, which federates together um, the EG, EGI, um, and ARC middleware in Europe, together with the open science grid in, in the US, and has it all working together to provide a seamless service for, for physicists. So you know, large-scale grid uh, was seen as an achievement then. But on the other hand, uh, we were still factors of four and five below the overall capacity that we needed. And we had problems with reliability um, and also understanding collaboration issues, not the technical issues. Um, OK, box management, we developed a configuration management system, um, Quator, and a monitoring system, Lemon. These, again, were something which were fairly static and uh, had done their purpose in 2007. There weren't really many challenges around there left uh, because we were already managing a significant number of boxes. So that I probably won't talk about much more. In, well, I know I won't talk about much more in this presentation. On the other hand, data management and distribution, um, this was certainly a, a major problem, um, or not a major problem, something where we knew we would be facing issues in the future. Now, some of the points are all to do with the, the data rates that we have, which were significant even then. Uh, we were expecting to have data flowing in from the experiments at 700 megabytes a second. Uh, we have to ship this out around CERN to the compute farm. That produces the reconstructed data that is useful for physicists, and you need to store all of that on tape at CERN, so over a gigasecond uh, normally, and up to two gigasecond when you're running in heavy iron mode. And then part of this data has also to be distributed out to CERN, out of CERN to the tier ones, at, you know, over 1,500 megabytes a second. So these were the sorts of data flows and rates that we were predicted then, and of course we hadn't yet achieved them. Um, so building the system and testing that on a scale of ensuring that we could do that before we actually got the real data was seen as a, as a major challenge back in 2007. Um, other issues that I'm not going to talk about in, in this talk, uh, but still are things which are in the, the back of um, people's minds, were that, okay, 15 petabytes a year, you know, 25 petabytes a year now, this is a large number of, of tape robots. Now, fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, IBM and storage tech, now Oracle, uh, have good roadmaps for their tape technology, which encourages us to believe that we're not going to need to be ever expanding in terms of, of tape robots. But still, managing the tape, managing the data is um, a problem. We have to reread past data between runs. This is an, an issue for the, the physics still. And in terms of tape, you know, IBM, Oracle might be coming up with newer generations of, of tapes, but if you want to keep your data in a manageable volume, you have to do the migration uh, between the old tapes and the new ones, and there's significant data rates to, to do that. So there's a lot of background um, work that goes on in this, uh, which was something which we considered as a challenge back in, in 2007. We've been through the 500 gig to uh, terabyte cartridges. Uh, we've exercised that, so we don't consider that so much a challenge. Um, but you know, so some of the reality is we've managed to streamline our tape operations, um, so this is good. And our concerns now in the, the data are in other areas that I'll talk about later. But nevertheless, it's still you know, background, huge data rates going on in the, in the tape farm uh, that not a challenge anymore, but still quite interesting. Um, okay, what's going on now? complex system, many different players, understanding uh, where things go wrong is a challenge. It was a challenge in 2007. I think it probably still is a challenge. Uh, there are still issues if you have a router at CERN, which is, or a switch at CERN, where you, one of the ports um, flips up and down occasionally and starts affecting the data rate out to Fermilab. How do you know that that switch is the cause of the problem. Um, when you see somebody from Fermilab that says the data rate out of CERN is, is suddenly lower. Uh, they don't have access to the monitoring data at CERN. Um, and the network people, okay, I think network people and uh, operating system people tend to live in their own world. Uh, at least they do at CERN. I don't know about your sites. Um, so they have good operations monitoring, but they don't always make it available to, to us. 
and a support um, going up or down is not the sort of thing that they're looking at um, necessarily. It's the thing which affects our work. So this was a challenge in 2007, and I think um, I don't really come back and address this later in, in the talk. Uh, so this is really, interestingly, still a problem in 2010. Um, my boss gave a talk about a couple of weeks ago saying, really, this was still one of the challenges that he thought he had to address. So if my boss thinks it's a problem, it's a problem. Okay. Because I covered that in 2007, um, and because I say that the LHC challenges and computing challenges are wider spread than I can cover, here's a couple more that coincidentally related to my database role, but I think are quite interesting, nevertheless, problems that were addressed uh, over the past few years. Now, this is about, or a representation of the energy equivalent of a 1 TV proton. So a proton at 1 TV, so a seventh of the, the full energy, has about as much energy as a mosquito buzzing along and bumping into you. So that's not very much. But on the other hand, there are trillions of particles in a bunch uh, that goes around the LHC beam. And there are something like 3,000 bunches in the beam. So if you do all that and do all the maths, then actually the energy in the beams is more like this, two high-speed trains colliding at um, 150 kilometers an hour. Now, you have to, you know, you think of that collision, you think of big trains, you have to think of the energy being concentrated in really a, a very tiny volume. Um, and if you dump it into a small volume, then together the beams could melt uh, around a ton of copper. So, you know, the serious energy in these beams. Um, now we are at a lower energy, 350 TV, uh, sorry, 3.5 TV, um, and not as many bunches. So we can only melt around 100 kilograms of copper. But we're still something like 20 times uh, the stored energy now uh, that Fermilab achieved. Other accelerators, the most stored energy they ever had in the beams was a couple of megajoules. We're operating today at around 40 megajoules, and the nominal beams is something like 360 megajoules. So these are serious amounts of energy. Um, and you know, examples of what you can do with three megajoules, uh, a problem when they were testing the injection of particles from one of our accelerators into the LHC, the magnetic fields weren't quite right, the beam was missteered and grazed uh, one of the beam lines and gouged a groove that you can see there, you know, a few millimeters for over a meter in the beam line. Um, and here is an example of where they deliberately shot a one thousandth energy of the, the nominal beam into copper to see what it would do, and it bores holes through copper. So the beam is really very dangerous, and controlling the beam and keeping you know, tight control of it is one of the computing challenges that the accelerator community have had to deal with in their preparations. Um, you know, have these particles going around 11,000 times a second. Uh, if there's a tiny change in the, the current in one of the magnets, that's going to amplify very, very quickly to shift the beam out where it will be grazing on the, the beam line for the LHC, dumping into one of the magnets. And you know, I talked earlier about the problems that you can have heating up a magnet, punching a hole in the, the helium vessel, you know, major problems for this. So managing the beam, keeping a control on it, has been really a major problem for the accelerator community. And the uh, point here that I do is that they have a sort of fly-by oracle system where they depend um, on oracle databases in three ways. Uh, they have one database application which looks after the short-term settings and, and control configuration, so they know what they accelerator configuration should be. Um, as they're ramping up the energy, you need to know how the, the beam current should be behaving based on a reference orbit, that you have that in the database, and then you have the control system to see how it is behaving, and you want to be logging that um, to understand if there was any problem, where did it come from. Uh, so there's a short-term real-time measurement log that they keep for around a week. And then they want to understand uh, the accelerator over a period of, of 20 years to understand how things have, have happened. So they keep a, an archive subset for over 20 years. Now, the point here is that the short-term 
settings database is something that the accelerator people are treating just as much as any of the electronic components or magnets or whatever um, in the the accelerator, the collimators that stop the beam or scrape the beam if it's diverging. Uh, if there is any problem with those, then they will dump the beam. If the database, this database is not available, then they will dump the beam as well. So this is an issue for us managing this database, keeping it available. Now, fortunately, they will lose the beam in a controlled manner. Um, this is the, the plan, uh, and so far they've done that. Uh, and, but if you have these energies that showing about the trains, how do they manage to dump the beam and, and in a controlled manner? Well, the beam dumps are specially designed. These are the two elements in the accelerator that can take the energy of the full beam. So these are eight meter long uh, graphite targets, especially constructed in huge amounts of, of lead and concrete shielding. And even then, these beam dumps can't take in a concentrated area the, the full energy of the beam. They have to paint that beam over the, the surface of, of the magnet and you can see here the, the reality on the, the left and the, um, the simulation compared to the simulation on the right. Um, this is done by steering magnetic, um, by changing magnetic fields and steering the beam. And you can imagine the precision of control that you have to have to do this in you know, microseconds, nanoseconds even, um, to paint the beam like that. So the computing challenge of building a control system, an operating system um, that can detect excess radiation um, and dump the beam within, I think, about four turns. So 11,000 times a second, uh, you know, this is really how rapidly they have to start changing magnetic fields, ramp up things to switch the beam into the dump um, and kick that. So the, the challenge for that is, is major for the accelerator people as well. As well. Uh, from our point, we're not in the, the Walmart scale for any of the data volumes that we have. Um, so although the experiment people want to look through and do the equivalent of finding if you buy beer and nappies on a Friday afternoon, um, we don't have the, the data volumes, but we have something like two trillion records already in the, um, this archive, and it's growing by four billion a day as the accelerator is, is operating. So you know, interesting uh, considerations that we have to, to manage that, um, especially as you know, some of the things that they want to do um, stop us using some of the nice partitioning that you'd like to do with the database uh, because they want to do searches across the full two trillion rows every now and then. So if we talk about control systems, there are also some in the accelerators, um, which I didn't talk about last time. If you look at the, the online world, uh, the accelerators also need to manage to make sure that the million channel accelerator uh, experiment and detector is all working. Um, you want to know that the high voltages are correct and all the, the right places. Uh, you want to understand the composition of the gas mixture and you need to understand the, the temperature of, of the detectors. And this is relevant for when you reconstruct the data later, the raw data. Uh, you can imagine that if the temperature increases by a small amount over these huge 44 meter detectors, there will be shifts in the positions. And when you're looking at creating micron precision, submicron precision track reconstruction, you need to know the temperature uh, when you're doing that. So these many channels um, that they have that they monitor uh, have to be recorded uh, really very frequently. And we have to distribute this data out to the tier ones because the reconstruction um, of the raw data, the initial processing of the raw data is done at CERN, but then the, the later reprocessing will be done at the tier ones. So they also need this control system uh, data on the, on the temperatures. Now this is a SCADA system that we use called um, PVSS. It's a German term for SCADA system. I forget, process something or other, Steuerung system. Um, and this is because the company ETM that, that designed this uh, was now owned by Siemens is, is Austrian. Um, I'll come to really why it's owned by Siemens uh, in the next few slides because to manage the, um, the 10 to the 6, the million control channels that we had, we needed to have a federated uh, control system. It wasn't possible to manage all of those channels on a single PVSS system. We needed to have around 150 working together in a federated manner on each experiment. Now, PVSS 
in principle was capable of doing this, but they'd only managed to have around four federated systems working together when we started exploiting PVSS in around 2000. Um, so we built this up to 150 federated systems. And Siemens were bidding for a project to control the, the New York Metro at a time. And their plan was to have a SCADA module system in each of the something like 650 metro stations in, in New York. I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but it was something like that. So they needed to build a federated system. Um, and they you know, heard about CERN and the 150 that we had and clearly thought that they could scale up from 150 to, to 650. Um, and so they decided to use PVSS as the basis of their bid for the control system for, um, for the New York Metro. And to be sure of that, they then bought ETM uh, so that they could have the, the control. But it's an example of the, some of the synergies that you can have between companies that are working in this area uh, and CERN, that the, their technology in principle um, could move to this level, but it's only through seeing that in practice at CERN that then they, uh, they developed it to really move on to, to bigger things elsewhere. Another example of that is that we needed to archive the information from PVSS in these Oracle databases. Uh, when we started off, Oracle and PVSS, uh, they could only deliver an archiving rate of around 100 events per second, whereas we needed 100,000 events per second going into the database. Uh, progressively modifying the way in which PVSS worked and looking at the ways in which we had the Oracle Rack uh, system configured, we managed to move up from 100 events a second, 2,000 events per second, uh, 15 thousand events per second, um, 150,000 events per second, but not stably, and then finally um, 150,000 events per second in a perfectly stable manner. So this was an extensive project with PVSS and Oracle um, over around six months or so, where I think, you know, as well as CERN learning and having the achieving the results that we needed, both PVSS and Oracle uh, learned something from this as well. And another example of improvements that we've produced for the Oracle technology is the streams replication that we do to, if you remember I said we have to ship this database out to the tier ones. Um, we have an Oracle database, they have Oracle databases, and we're using the, the streams technology that they had in, in 10G. Uh, this is partly because we didn't have Oracle 11G when we started off doing this, 2005-7. Um, um, so we didn't have Golden Gate. Uh, we didn't have Active Data Guard that Oracle has at the moment. Uh, we had Streams, which you know, was delivering relatively low performance that you can see here, around 4,500 logical change records per second um, compared to the level that you can now achieve in 11G, which is 3,700, th sorry, 37,000. Uh, based on improvements uh, that CERN helped to deliver working with the Oracle engineers for that. So there are examples of the, the challenges uh, that we have. Um, solving these challenges at CERN do lead to improvements in uh, technologies that companies that work with us can then exploit in, in other areas. Now, I think Oracle is not exploiting streams for iTunes. They're using Active Data Guard or whatever. Um, but I hope, I imagine, that some of the effort that went into understanding how you deliver these rates for, uh, for CERN fed into other design ideas um, for the later technology products that maybe underpin iTunes. Who knows? OK, reality. Um, I talked a lot about preparation in different areas and also some of the reality, but coming to those challenges that we had in the past, um, reality. So what's praise for a sysadmin? Anybody? Silence. That's praise for a sysadmin. Nobody ever says anything to you if things are going well. You only hear if things are going badly, and you know, I'm sure you all know this. So, you know, pretty amazing when we have our research director talking to the, the member state people. Um, last place on the slide, is that the least important, the most important, whatever, but it's the only bold bullet. Um, he's you know, saying that the LHC computing grid that we've built has been a key factor in the spectacular startup of the um, of the accelerator, and he's talking about not the accelerator startup, he's talking about the whole build up to startup to delivering physics. 
Um, Fabiola Gianotti, who's the spokesperson of the Atlas um, detector. Now, in particle physics jargon, this is the boss. Uh, it's not the, the media spokesperson. This is the you know, chairman of the board, if you like, or chairwoman of the board in, in this case. Um, so back in 2004, a bit before the, when we were still in the preparation phase, she was really worried that the grid wouldn't allow people to do physics anywhere, anytime. She's saying that you know, the grid has to allow it to do that, um, not slow down delivery of physics. If you think back to her mindset then, she was in the mode where the previous experiment that she worked on, all of the computing was at CERN, uh, was controlled by a single organization. And she was worried that the, the federated grid that we were building would step in the way of, of doing this because you'd have so many people, so many different organizations involved. What did she say in July this year? So you can read. More striking still is the speed with which the raw data are being processed. The data is available at universities around the world within hours of it being taken at CERN. Um, this is something which used to take, well, not that long ago, it took weeks. When I was doing my experiment, it took months. And one of the things I used to do from time to time was take a, a round tape of data from CERN back to my university. Uh, and if I only went to CERN every three months or so, I only got the new data at my university every three months. Um, now, the physicists today in universities in America, wherever around the world, they're getting data hours after it's produced at, at CERN. And the data at those universities can be processed by the experiments as a whole to deliver real physics results. So the computing grid that we've built, which builds together these hundred odd universities isn't some complex beast that in principle should work but never does. It actually is delivering physics results. So the, this conference was in July, July the 21st it says there. The 18th, the accelerator switched, um, improved its operations mode and delivered as much data on July the 18th as it had delivered since March. So you know, half of the data set that was presented on July the 21st had only been recorded three days earlier. And the fact that the physicists could analyze that data and present results at a conference in three days is due to the, the success of the grid. Um, so it's really truly amazing that the, this thing does work. Well, you know, it doesn't seem amazing now because we've been building up to it over a number of years. But if you go back to you know, how we were thinking in 2004, uh, you know, would this thing actually work? or would it get in the way of the physics? I think it's a spectacular success that it's you know, enabling people to analyze data in three days, uh, uniting the, resourcing, uh, the computing resources that are available ar around the world. So some examples of the you know, pictures of the data that we've had, stored around five petabytes this year. Um, this, the accelerator hasn't been running full tilt. You know, they've been improving things, as I say, uh, over time. Um, so our extrapolation now is that we'll get something like 25 petabytes of data uh, over a year. Uh, the yellow chart on the right, this shows the luminosity, and you can see how the accelerator has been leaping up um, as they move in more bunches. And their main worry uh, about taking those steps has just been the energy. Each time they're doubling the energy, so you know, going from one megajoule to two to four to whatever, they, you can understand based on the plots I showed earlier why they're taking their time doing that. Uh, but we're delivering the target luminosity now, uh, and so we're ready to, in 2011, um, run at full tilt, at least at 3.5 TeV. Uh, we're shipping a petabyte of data around in, in CERN and um, accepting data at over 2.5 gigabytes a second with peaks of up to 7. So this is compared to data rates that we thought would be around a gigabyte a second uh, in the planning in 2007. The usage worldwide, um, I realize I should have included a plot uh, showing that the tier twos are actually used. Um, I do have one, and, but the tier two centers are being used. If you look at the resources which are underused, they're the resources which are sitting at CERN. So the grid is enabling distributed computing resources to be brought together to run the million jobs a day that you see there up on the right. Um, and we have large numbers of users now actually doing the analysis, uh, not two or three people that we had back in 2007 doing the tests. So the, you know, the grid usage you know, is really good. Challenges in 2007, we clearly managed the ramp up. Um, you can see that we moved from uh, the 
you know, 2007 we were down here. Um, we had to get factors of four or five up here. We've, we've done that. Uh, the plot I showed in 2007 was that we needed around 2,500 boxes. In fact, you probably can't read this on the screen, we have something like 5,000 at CERN. Um, and we have, rather than seven petabytes of, of data, we, of disk, we actually have more like 18 at CERN at the moment, um, with large amounts of, of disk in the tier ones. So that ramp up uh, was being done. Reliability, uh, well this chart ends in 2009 because it sort of leveled off at around 98% uh, reliability for the grid. Now I can hear people thinking, well, you know, I wouldn't fly on a plane that's 98% reliable and I want to be you know, a bit more sure that I'm going to get there than, uh, than that. But I think what you have to compare is not to the reliability of a plane, you have to compare to the reliability of an airline. And if you look at uh, flightstats.com, um, on the left there are two major European airlines that are you know, 3% of the flights have an excessive delay. So people do fly on airlines that are only 90%, 97% likely to get them to their destination without an excessive delay. And that's a more reasonable comparison to the 98% reliability that, that we have. Because if jobs fail, there can be retry in the system and the physicists will actually get their results with a slight delay. Um, they won't be told, okay, go away, it didn't work, you know, you're, you're dead because the plane's crashed. They'll be told, you know, here's the data, uh, it's late. Um, the chart on the right is actually quite shocking. Um, that's the reliability or the, the delay chart for the, the route that I took to get here from Zurich to, to San Francisco. I'm not quite sure I would have planned that route if I'd known those statistics ahead of time. So what have we learned? What are the operational issues? What are the problems that we have? Well, this shows it broken down into the different areas um, that you can see by quarter. So the chart is around 10 incidents. So that's one incident per, uh, per tier one or whatever over the quarter. The things that we've learned is storage is complicated. Um, there's a lot of complex technology, a lot of systems that need to interoperate to transfer data between CERN um, there's a mass storage system involved at CERN. There's uh, the different transfer technology, the retry in the networks, um, whatever, authentication. The system to talk between different storage systems that have slightly different command sets. All of this is complicated. And because it's complicated, it fails, and, and we see that, which gives rise to, I think, storage is the red bars that you see here. Uh, hardware failures are frequent. Um, 18 petabytes of disk at CERN. I forget how many we have overall, but I figured yesterday we have something like um, getting on for 200,000 disks across the, the grid. Uh, you know, 300,000 lifetime MTBF. Don't, nobody believes that. It's more like 100,000 hours. Uh, 200,000 disks. You know, he's getting disks failing um, every hour uh, around the grid. And these, when they cause problems in storage systems, uh, then um, even more. Now the storage system problems are actually not the disk failing, it's more like the RAID controller failing, but then you have to rebuild your database, you have to rebuild your storage server, and that takes a while. So this adds to the, the level of problems that you see in the, the database line, which is green here, and the storage line, which is, is red. So the hardware failures are something that we have to, to deal with. The infrastructure is just a fact of life. Um, we have 10 tier one centers. If each of those has only one power or cooling failure a year, the grid we have to deal with uh, a failure a month for that. And then we also have to worry about the failures in the tier twos. So you know, this is something that really we've got to an irreducible minimum now. But the good news is that networks and uh, software are reliable. The middleware, you know, they don't fail. So this is quite good. An interesting operational problem that I'll talk about because of the, the solution that we've developed is the need to have the experiment software available at sites uh, and available to the grid worker nodes. Now, an experiment sitting at CERN, some guy writes a new bit of software, has to distribute the library out to these 150 odd sites around the world. Um, so the problem is the correct execution of the installation task there. And how do you know that that's worked? Um, and if you have a couple of thousand nodes at the, the sites, uh, if you have to run the installation job on all of them, how do you know it's been done? So probably what people do, or definitely what people do, is they have a shared file system to do that. Uh, we use AFS at CERN. Lots of sites use NFS. And then this NFS service is a bottleneck 
then for the nodes that have to read that software later, AFS has advantages there um, because it caches the, the software um, in the AFS cache on the node. But NFS, uh, where you have a few hundred nodes that are hitting your NFS server, this becomes a bottleneck. So an interesting solution um, that's been developed to this or has the potential to, to deliver that is this CERN VM file system. Now CERN VM is the IBM mainframe that I worked on 20 odd years ago when I started at CERN, but it's also the name for a shrunk down uh, file system, a shrunk down virtual machine image system that's developed at CERN. And CERN VM FS is a file system uh, based on Fuse, a few other things, using HTTP uh, caches in the middle here, squid caches, um, that will cache the information on the node just as AFS does. So using this CERN VM FS software uh, is definitely an advantage. So this shows an issue at our site in Barcelona where as you increase the number of parallel jobs using the NFS server, you see the longer time it, it takes to, to do anything. The caching file system, you take a hit initially uh, when you run the first job, but then after that everything is, is stable. So this CERNVM file system is a very promising development um, that's been made by the, the software people over the past couple of years at, at CERN. Uh, the other interesting point, and there's a URL to a, another presentation on the, the slide there that I guess the presentation will be made available to people so you can look at that. Um, because it's a caching file system, uh, the experiment creates a new release of their software, but not everything will change. So you can see here that there's 18 million files, but there's only 3.5 million that are actually unique. Um, 600 gig total volume for Atlas, I think, here. No, overall it's uh, so a couple of experiments. Um, but only uh, less than 100 gig needs to be transferred really between sites. So with this caching file system, um, there's an interesting solution to some of the problems there in terms of distribution. Because you don't need to run the job at all of the 140 sites. You change the software on the CERN VM file system at CERN, it will replicate through the uh, HTTP caches that we have and end up at the different sites to make sure that everyone has the right version of the software. So this is something which is being evaluated really quite significantly now at Rutherford um, in the UK and at Peak in, in Barcelona. Uh, and I would imagine you know, over the next couple of years, this is something which will start to be used at more and more sites to solve the problem of software distribution that we have uh, and also shared file system bottlenecks. Um, okay, consensus rather than control. Well, I think this remains a challenge in 2010. Um, we, not to say that we don't have consensus, uh, we do, but the problem is maintaining that consensus across the, the large number of sites and making sure that everybody knows about it. You know, you have 100 odd sites, how does everybody know what the consensus is, what software they're supposed to be installing? Um, you know, that's difficult. And in a number of cases, we've reinvented the wheel. So the Quator system, administration system that we developed, uh, that I showed in 2007, has not been widely adopted by the tier one and tier twos. Uh, it has been adopted by a major financial institution. Um, they went out and evaluated a number of configuration systems, probably some that are being talked about here this week, um, and decided that Quator was a neat idea. And they now have um, around five times the number of boxes that they have at CERN. I think they have around 20,000 systems that they're managing with Quator. So they quite like it, but you know, the other tier ones, tier twos, uh, don't seem to, to use that. Um, interestingly, Puppet seems to be something which a number of the tier twos are starting to adopt. So perhaps that's more appropriate to, to their scale and they can collaborate amongst themselves. Uh, but you know, the idea that we would be able to have a common uh, configuration management system across the community certainly hasn't worked out. Um, so, you know, this sociological issues uh, are still a challenge in 2010. Um, I mentioned here a point about set UID software being installed at sites. The background to this is also interesting. Uh, and it comes back to something that we call pilot jobs. Now, this is a classic picture of how the, the grid is supposed to work, that users send jobs off to a resource broker and it will send it to a site uh, that can run the job. Now, this is good for the site because they have a queue of jobs waiting locally so that their resources can be used e efficiently. On the other hand, the user has a problem in that their job gets sent to site A, uh, and it just so happens that site B, they 
have the resource which comes available first, so somebody else is the one that gets the, the fastest turnaround time. Uh, so they don't like this, and the experiments came up with this pilot job solution where what you have is users submit their jobs not to the, the central grid, but to a queue which is managed by each experiment, and then they decide which job will, at the front of the queue, will go to the first resource which becomes available in any of the grids. Uh, so this addresses the, the point that the, the job at the front of the queue is guaranteed to be the first one to start execution, not go to a site um, which might be the second one to start execution. And then coming back to the software point I talked about earlier, um, the job will check for the, the correct software environment before really doing the job execution. So that's a reliability issue as, as well. Now an interesting point about this, and it comes back to how you can use the hundred systems around the, the universities efficiently for the experiments when you want to do analysis in three days is that they decide which job comes off the front of the queue. So if you're a poor graduate student, um, it might not be your job which comes off first, it will be the experiment software production job uh, which comes off first. So this is the way in which the, the, the grid efficiency can be managed for the experiments. So it's a change in terms of the reality that we imagined for the grid compared to uh, 2007 um, in the sense that more of the grid intelligence is in software which is run on behalf of each of the experiments rather than being in the, the central layer. Uh, on the other hand, as we move forward, it's likely that the experiments will collaborate more and come out on the, the best system for that. Okay, data issues. Um, well, this is the picture I showed earlier with the data rates. I think I mentioned that we're talking about uh, two and a half gig to tape in Proton running. Um, earlier this year, the experiment said, oh, okay, you're doing this for Proton running. Um, how about rather than sending you just one and a half gig a second for heavy iron, we send you three and a half gig a second. Um, and then, you know, what does this mean for the data rates that you have to write to tape? Well, here's a plot that shows uh, what we were doing on Monday, where you actually have to add together the red and blue curves um, to show that we were managing to write tape at something like four and a half gigabytes a second uh, to our tape library. Now, I'm not sure whether that's sustainable over hundreds of days, um, but certainly, you know, it shows that for the production data, uh, the system that we built, the tests that we did, um, we were able to address the, the challenges that we had and make sure that we had enough headroom there uh, to deliver the, uh, the problems that, that we needed, deliver challenges that if, we, if they went above what they, they predicted. On the other hand, although the mass storage systems have worked well for this environment, um, there are a number of features that aren't really ad adapted to the analysis that people are starting to do now. Uh, we've got thousands of physicists now that are accessing the data to do their analysis, not two or three people who are doing controlled data access. So the experiments want to manage their data availability. They don't want to let Castor do that. So features that we put into the system um, 2005, 2007 aren't really used. We have real conflicts between um, file sizes, file placement, and access patterns. Uh, our file sizes are only something like 200 megabytes on average. Okay, heavy iron, they're probably a bit larger. But if you want to deliver data rates of you know, four and a half gigabytes a second to tape, what you have to do is take the data that you've recorded and stream it out in parallel across many tape drives. The problem, of course, is that when people want to read it back, they're going to want to read back data um, that was recorded at the same moment in time. And so they're going to have to mount many, many tapes to get the data back and not be able to stream it off one tape. So there's a conflict between the write access pattern that you need and the, the read access pattern. Now, this is alleviated by the way that the experiments manage the data transfer between the tape and disk because they know which data set will be recovered over time. Um, the other point, though, is that the analysis favors low latency over guaranteed data rates. So we have systems in our features in the Castor system that if you know that a disk server can only deliver um, you know, a gigabyte a second and people are reading 100 megasecond, you can only allocate 10 readers to, to that file server. Uh, people don't like the latency that checking that you're not the 11th person introduces. They want immediate access to the file at the risk of a later uh, access penalty. And so you know, this is something that we have to, to deal with. Now this point is that the um, 
experiment management of data aggravates this issue because they don't want the file system uh, to replicate data across disk servers. Uh, so these are some of the reality problems that we see now as we've moved into an era where we're having many people doing the analysis. So it's probably a time to move on to the future outlook because changing the way in which we're managing the data is um, a major point that we, we have. So what we imagine that we will do there is rather than having the analysis access exactly the same disk pools in exactly the same manner as the coordinated data recording and input from the experiments does, we'll break that and put the analysis data on a separate file system uh, which is only managed by this low latency access protocol called XROOT uh, that was developed at, at Slack. Now, interestingly, this you know, has a nice advantage for the experiments because if you look on the, the left, what they're doing here is exporting data from CERN to the tier ones and later to the tier twos using a software suite that, that they've developed to do that data export. If we do this separate analysis pool at CERN, then they do the managed replication to, of the data to the analysis farm at CERN in an exactly analogous way to the way in which they do that to other centers. So it's a system which will ease the overall data management uh, for the experiments. Um, another point is to address hardware reliability in software, you know, as is done elsewhere. So here we bring back the model where the storage system will create multiple replicas of files. But on the other hand, we drop the disk mirroring that we have. Um, and so we're more exposed to the failure of an individual disk. But if the mass storage system is uh, storing multiple copies, then that's not a problem. And of course, lots of people are doing this elsewhere. Um, Hadoop is a, maybe not a file-based system, a block-based system for doing that. And there's growing interest in the use of that um, at tier twos. The other interesting point then is that there's something like um, eight orders of magnitude, it says there, uh, for CMS in terms of, of which data is actually used. So the experiments, um, they send the data out to the tier ones, to the tier twos, so that some of the data um, is, well, okay, all of the data, there are multiple copies of the data by the time you get down to the, the tier two layer, but at any individual tier two might not have the, the data set that's uh, in this peak over here. You, know, you don't control the data that arrives at your tier two, so it may be that you have the data set which is down here. Now, of course, this means that if you have a hot data set up here, then grid jobs, they need to go to the subset of the tier twos um, where that data is stored. So what people are looking at now is dynamic data replication across the grid. Uh, the point I talked on the previous slide is data replication within a given grid site. Here is the idea that what you notice in Atlas is that a given data set um, is being hammered by the users and so you'll automatically then make sure that all of the tier twos, all of the tier ones have that data set and then you know, within the tier two each individual tier two, you'll have replication to make sure that it's available on many disk servers. So you know, coming back to introduce automatic dynamic data replication um, is one of the things that we'll be looking to do in coming years. Um, another point then is that network capacity is readily available. The picture on the left is a model, I think it was models of networked analysis at regional centers, nice monarch butterfly there, that we had in around 2000, where we imagined that the peak bandwidth we'd have between sites um, was 622 megabits. Um, now, okay, this was for 2005, and we're in 2010. But even in 2010, we had um, you know, gigabit, 10 gigabit links. And we're now at you know, 20 gigabit links between CERN and Fermilab. Uh, and there are high energy physics sites that are testing out 100 gigabit links today. So the network capacity is certainly readily available. Still an issue about price, but the capacity is available, and it's reliable. Um, we have redundant light paths, uh, so if you follow these in, they come to you know, different ends of the CERN box. So where somebody drove a tractor through a, a fiber channel, uh, when we were doing a test in 2009, alternative routes took over. There was a hit in bandwidth, but at least the system carried on. So why not simply copy data from another site over the, the network? This is certainly you know, very interesting if the alternative would be to recall it from tape. 
uh, the mechanical movement, having to get the, the tape drive available, um, will create a lot of overhead uh, for, for this. So recalling the data from another site over the network is likely to be more efficient. Um, and if it's not available locally, because your file server broke or because it's a hot data set that wasn't allocated to you coming back to the replication, um, you know, I think this is the thing that we'll start to do. Not say, sorry, I haven't got the data set here, to have some automation which will find out where that data set is and copy it um, to the, the site. So the distribute the, the jobs to where the data is uh, that we had in the past was based on the idea that network bandwidth would be not available. Um, we're starting to move into a situation now where we'll move the data from where it is to where it needs to be uh, because that's easy and efficient. Um, okay, so these are all things that we might like to do in the future. When? Uh, well, there I said that the accelerator needs to shut down in 2012 for putting these big copper clamps around the interconnections. So we really want to deploy this, develop this over the next year or so, um, and deploy in 2012 to have this ready uh, for the, the run in 2013. Although, of course, you know, some of these ideas, like the dynamic data replication, are easy to introduce, um, and we might see those starting doing next year. But the real big change, I think, compared to 2007, is the ready availability of the network capacity. Uh, it's much more available than we'd imagined. Um, as I say, there's still the issue of cost, but uh, at least we're, we're there. Okay, another point then is virtualization. Uh, now here, I should say, this is not the consolidation virtualization that you, know, you take um, 10 idle servers and pack them into two or three busier ones. This is virtualizing batch systems which are meant to run at uh, around 100%. But there are three different developments of ways to do this now which are integrated into different batch schedulers. And basically the idea is that you have a, a queue of jobs in your batch scheduler that say what they want in terms of operating system environment, um, software environment. Uh, you scan that and you start a virtual machine which magically connects the batch system and hey, it's got the right environment for the job to run um, so it gets slotted into so that virtual machine. Um, so, as I say, this is running on systems, virtualizing systems that are running at 100%. So there's a cost for users. Uh, now, this cost is low for some jobs. Um, simulation CPU intensive ones, you know, everybody knows the virtualization, virtualization overhead of, of CPUs is very low, and this is what we see. On the other hand, if you're doing more I.O. intensive applications, as our users are, they see something like a 10% penalty, 10, 15% for other jobs user analysis. Um, and this they start to worry about because they've been optimizing their code to run efficiently on systems for the past few years. And now the sites are saying, hey, well, it doesn't matter. You know, you can um, run virtualized and you know, it doesn't worry about the penalty. But of course, the reason for that is that the, the sites see efficiency advantages. Um, here's a model of how we're doing it at, at CERN, where you start up a virtual machine, um, and it carries on accepting jobs for a day. And then when the last job that you've accepted finishes, you kill the virtual machine and, and start a new one. So it may be that you have a virtual machine here that runs a, a long job, um, only runs one, virtual, one job during the life of the virtual machine, well, here you have another one where it will run two or three jobs, and then when this, this one finishes, it, it restarts. Now, of course, the point here is that when you restart there, you can restart with a completely different um, operating system. And you know, the advantage of this is to reconfigure, um, upgrade your system, new version of the operating system, patched uh, kernel or whatever. You don't have to yourself drain all your batch nodes um, have a manual intervention to reinstall them uh, and all these things that I guess people do regularly, um, you can have this thing happen automatically. You create a new virtual machine image and over time as all of your uh, however many jobs restart, they will pick up the new kernel and it will automatically repatch the, the system over time without any idle periods while systems are waiting to, to have that done. Now, the other problem, though, is how many systems do you have? If you've got a virtual machine per core, um, as we would have naturally in our environment, you've got a fact, an order of magnitude more systems already. And these are plots showing how um, LSF query commands behave as you increase 
the number of, of jobs along here up to something like 40,000 along that axis. And as you increase the number of worker nodes uh, from 2,000 down here up to, to 16,000. So this is some work that was done recently testing the system um, at large scale with virtual machines. Now today we operate in, in this little corner down here where everything is, is nice and blue. Um, if you go up to you know, even here where you have many worker nodes, you see the response time increases on this query command here. And guess what? We have users who, in their infinite wisdom, have assumed that this command will always have a response time below two seconds. Um, and so you know, the whole of the Atlas data collection system collapses if the response time goes above two seconds. And it goes above two seconds if you have 16,000 virtual machines, even for a small number of jobs. So you know, this is another reason why they're saying, hey, you can't virtualize. This goes badly. Um, but we hope that they can start scheduling, uh, rather than on a single processor, they can start scheduling their jobs to work cooperatively across multiple systems. Um, a more interesting point is whether or not we can cut out the local workload management system completely. Um, if you go back to the pilot job frameworks that you had, uh, maybe what you can do is dynamically instantiate virtual machines that will connect to the virtual job frameworks um, and not have any control locally over which jobs run. All you will do as a site is start up the right number of virtual machines to make sure that you fulfill your commitment to deliver 30% of your time to CMS, say, 40% to Atlas, and however much to LHCB and, uh, and um, Alice. So you know, I think this is uh, an interesting challenge um, in the future that we you know, start doing this and separate the different roles of site administrators and experiment administrators uh, to deliver capacity and then to prioritize work. Um, this then obviously leads on to the idea that you share virtual machine images between sites. Um, if you're doing that, an image which is generated at Fermilab could be started at a site in Nebraska or wherever. And going back to the picture I showed at CERN in terms of the way you dynamically repatch your system as you restart virtual machines, uh, this is something that you could do across the, the smaller sites. Um, you know, these are tier twos, don't have teams of system administrators. They have you know, half to one person doing that. Uh, if the image with a patch kernel is generated and just automatically uh, introduced at their site, then the overall security of the grid will Im improve. Um, on the other hand, you know, trust is needed to, to make this work. Uh, we don't have tightly firewalled systems like Amazon do for EC2. We have NFS file systems, as I've just talked about, uh, where you know, clearly you don't want to have any risk that somebody can come in and um, be root if they've sent you the virtual machine image. So trust is needed to make this acceptable. And you know, trust and consensus take time to build. Uh, it's not a technical problem. OK, summary conclusion. Um, so preparation for LHC computing has been long. Uh, we started in 2000, 2001 doing this for the grid seriously. So I've been involved with this for, well, over 10 years now. I went to my first computing for LHC conference um, in around 97, I think. Um, so it was a long time we've been doing this. I think it's been technically challenging. Uh, if you look today at some of the things that we have, it doesn't look so technically challenging. Um, you know, I mentioned Hadoop and some of the things that's being done there. You know, why didn't you do that? Well, the reason is that we started off 10, 13 years ago thinking about problems um, based on a mindset then. And a mindset, as I've said, uh, partly included the idea that networks were expensive and uh, you know, small. And this has, has changed over time. So some of the choices we made we might not make them if we started over today, but they were genuine choices that we had to make to solve technical problems that existed you know, five or 10 years ago. And I think it was a challenging situation. And if you look at things that we've done with this PVSS system, um, which has developed a commercial system into something which has then gone on to be deployed in the, the New York Metro, uh, I think you know, this is a value of some of the things that we've delivered. Uh, sociologically challenging, um, that remains true, building consensus and whatever, but we certainly achieved that. And I think it's something that we're quite good at doing as a community. Um, but despite that, it's been successful. Uh, I think you know, the glowing testimonies that I've shown you know, are really convincingly saying that it has been successful, even if 
we can deliver improvements based on the experience that we've had with real data, and especially in the way in which you handle many thousands of people doing analysis on the data set rather than just two or three people. I'd like to also think that it's been an exciting adventure um, that I've enjoyed, and I hope that you have appreciated at least the detail that I've given this morning and can see that it has been an exciting adventure, even if I only covered a small part of it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll open it for questions. Uh, please use the mics and state your name and affiliation before the uh, before your question. Doug Hughes with DE Shaw Research. Um, so when you're collecting 15 petabytes of data a year, obviously you have challenges with backups, but um, more importantly, how do you deal with data integrity issues? How do you know that the data that you've written out there is the same data you're reading back, and can you check some, but at that scale, I'd expect even, you've got to question the reliability of your checksums and have checksums on those. Okay, so how do we guarantee reliability, uh, have checksums on checksums? Um, so yeah, we certainly do have checksums, and the Checksums on checksums we don't have, but in fact, partly that works out because the data that we have is compressed. And so, therefore, if you uncompress it and get something different, you can't read it in a way which is meaningful. Um, so the experiments are capable of, if we give them something where our checksum is incorrect, but you know, it'd be interesting to know what the data likelihood is. I mean, MD5 checksum, the number of billions of files that we've got. Um, probably not very likely that you could corrupt the checksum and have something which is correct. But even if we did, by the time you unzip that, the experiment will see that there is uh, a problem. The, one of the issues I didn't cover is the point about the, the data on tape. Um, we have had points where you know, we store the data on tape, we recover it, and we find that the, the checksum there is, um, is corrupted. And we want to find that before the users find it themselves. So one of the, the background issues that we do have um, is to slowly scan over all our tape data and look for corrupted data. And then coming back to the network issue, we'll actively copy that from another site that has the data and store it locally. And nobody needs to know that it's been corrupted um, at CERN. So yeah, it, it's a, a never ending uh, challenge that. Mario Bejas, Raytheon. On uh, one of your slides, you um, made an explicit effort to point out that you're using the Siemens SCADA devices and how important they are to you. So two months ago, when the uh, Stuxnet worm characteristics came out and they talked about how they target air-gapped Siemens SCADA systems, specific ones, um, can you talk about uh, the LHC's response to that and, and what you did about it? Okay, well, I actually didn't. So this is the Stuxnet worm, and if we're using Siemens SCADA systems, are we vulnerable? Can I talk about it? Um, I didn't say that we use Siemens SCADA devices. I said we use Siemens SCADA software. Um, on the other hand, you might make assumptions, and um, you know, Siemens SCADA hardware is, is pretty reliable. Uh, sorry, pretty widespread. Um, we actually have, okay, I mean, I, what, don't know, so I can't talk about some of these things, but the, um, there's, you know, obviously I don't want to go in, can't go into too much detail rather than I don't want to, but we certainly have um, a set of different networks uh, at CERN, and so the network that SCADA system's on is not the same network that the batch systems are on, is not the same network as the um, network that I can access here to, to go and read my email. Um, so we do have, um, you know, firewalls, you know, bottlenecks, whatever, between the systems for that to try and protect the, these systems. Um, more interestingly, coming back to the points I said about the work that we've done with ETM to develop their system and the work that we've done with Oracle on some of the streams and other software, 
Uh, we do have a partnership with Siemens, HP and others where we've looked specifically at the security concerns. So we've been proactively for a number of years talking to companies about the need uh, for security for SCADA. Um, and in fact, you know, okay, not boasting too much, but it is something that we have been doing ahead of that becoming um, commonly known. We were certainly doing it before the, the power plant issues and uh, some of the, the lines that you've seen about breakdowns of, of SCADA systems. You know, we've been aware of the problem for you know, certainly 10 years now and actively working with companies on uh, this issue for at least five. Hi, uh, Paul Kruzak from AMD. Uh, <clears throat> I'm curious, <clears throat> excuse me, about the uh, pipelining of your data. You've got these huge, huge data sets that are moving around uh, all over the world. And how do you ensure that once a piece of data has moved out of the experiment and is on your, you know, your local CERN file servers, that once it begins the distribution efforts that you get complete and timely copies at the remote sites and further that the remote sites know they've got a complete copy and that uh, you know what happens if a transfer halfway through stops I mean how do you deal with that pipelining issue where you've got this constant flow of data um, well <laughs> this is comes on the fact that actually I've you know you how do we cope with the, the pipelining and distribution of the data sets it's, it's picking up exactly on one of the points that I haven't addressed and you know, that's the point that um, the experiments themselves partly have developed software to, to do that. Uh, we provide at the low layer running on you know, grid FTP mechanisms to do the transfer. Um, we provide a file transfer service um, that uses grid FTP to manage the bandwidth between sites. Um, so it comes back to sharing resources again. If there is a link between CERN and, and Rutherford, say, um, they expect half of that link to be used for Atlas data and something like that. We have to guarantee that you know, half of it can be used for Atlas data if that's necessary. So this is what we provide with the file transfer service. Then the experiments themselves have built software on, that uses um, the FTS. So CMS has built one called FedEx for physics data export. Um, but clearly, you know, you can understand why they chose the name. And they have the large bookkeeping systems and you know, databases where they know uh, which files are part of which data set, uh, which processed data file belongs with which raw data file, and which data file should go where. And they will then look at the cataloging with what's arrived at the remote sites and compare that to what's expected. So you know, basically, there's more software than I've talked about here, uh, more databases and more catalogs. And this is also interesting as well then, because you, I've talked about exporting the conditions database within Oracle. Um, having the distributed file catalogs coherent is a problem that they've addressed. Um, some of them have ad addressed that partly with Oracle. Uh, they've also addressed it using squid caches and um, data transfer uh, because they're using MySQL databases in some places and Oracle in others. Uh, so you know, really it's took it, taken a while to, to develop that. It is a complex area um, and it's, you're right, it's one I didn't address at all. Thank you. Hi, Bill Cheswick, AT&T Labs. I, I've thought, or idly about attacks on the integrity of scientific data. The idea of perhaps finding the dirty word nebula in the middle of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, you have a lot of data here and I assume once it's captured it goes out into the world and gets checked some. Do you ever worry about some fairly technically advanced nihilist coming in and introducing events that weren't there or casting doubts on this? Is this something that you've thought about at all and does it seem like a likely attack? Okay, so have we talked about people introducing um, goof data? I have definitely thought about it because somebody asked that question in 2007. I hadn't thought about it before 2007. Okay. Um, the, I think the answer that I gave then is that to actually do that um, is incredibly complicated. And to turn it the other way around, one of the debates that we have actively, and another point I talked about 2007 I haven't talked about now, is long-term data preservation. Um, the question that we asked is, you know, you're storing this data, you know, society's paid billions of dollars, you know, 
tens, hundreds of billion dollars if you integrate this out to 2030. Where will that data sit? Um, and how can people look at it? And I think the difficulty that we have is, unlike the Sloan data, which is made available and is relatively easy to understand for people that can, can recreate that, unlike climate change data, which has been relatively easy to, to reevaluate, the understanding the data involves such a level of complexity um, in terms of the way in which it's stored and the reliance on, for example, the conditions database. Uh, you'd have to inject it, you'd have to understand exactly what the temperature was at that time to have something which looked meaningful. Um, and you know, the problem that we have then is how do we make the data available to people in a way that they can analyze it? That's a difficult job for us. And I think the you know, inverse is then, if we don't know how to do that, it would be very surprising if people knew how to inject data in that would fool us in any significant way. But you know, I, I don't have any guarantee that that's a true answer. So uh, I'm Matt Simmons from St. Lawrence's Admin Blog. Um, a lot of us have disaster recovery plans, but I'm not really sure our disasters are on the same scale as yours. <laughs> For instance, I offsite my tapes with Iron Mountain. Um, what do you do with yours? Okay, so what do we offsite our data? Um, well, I think the answer to that is that we offsite our data to the, to, to the tier ones. Um, there are two copies of the raw data in aggregate. One at CERN and one spread around the, the sites. And then the derived data, there are multiple copies at CERN and elsewhere. Um, on the other hand, uh, off-siting the computing facilities so that we can um, restore them is something where we're probably relatively amateurish and we're starting to, to do that now. Uh, and it's a concern for things like the, the accelerator operation. Uh, the, you know, one of the arguments in the past is, okay, it doesn't really matter if the computer center isn't there because um, you won't be able to do the physics anyway. But uh, if you have a, a shorter period of downtime for some of the servers, we are trying to offsite the servers there um, and you know, look at other technologies for that. So I'm not sure our disasters compared to Chernobyl or you know, Three Mile Island or whatever are that serious. We just destroy a, an accelerator, um, but the computing system won't do that. Um, so the raw data that we generate, you know, that's replicated to collaborating sites. Off-siting our systems such that we can maintain availability um, is difficult, and partly it's a financial one. Um, you know, we have looked at some of this in the past, and you know, we're not a bank, we're not generating revenue, we don't have problems with that. And if you look at the, the way in which people are prepared to put money into us, they're not prepared to, to back that up. But we are sort of moving that in terms of off-siting the facilities as a, you know, a development in the, the next couple of years. But the data is safe. Hi, okay. um, Hugh Brown from the University of British Columbia. Um, you mentioned how uh, people ask you, you know, why didn't you use or invent Hadoop? And, and it's because you were constrained by the assumptions and the, the conditions, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, having gone through that once or twice, um, and I imagine you're, you're starting to think about the next, the next round of, of technology and how you'll do things. Do you think you've come up with any insights or techniques that, that might help um, prevent being quite so constrained this time around? Um, okay, so what insights? You know, having gone through the experience when I give to something else. Well, to some extent, my background is a you know, facilities sort of person. And the real you know, background I would give is, is don't believe the input that people give you for what their requirements will be. Because you know, they will underestimate them and they will overcomplicate things. And you know, just make sure that you have something which uses the reliable technology that you're sure of to deliver something that you know um, is scalable. And if you look at some of the things where we, you know, people said that we want to restore uh, store data at 700 megasecond and they're sending it to us at um, 4 gigasecond, I think that you know, that's the aspect that you can do. Then you know, the bright guys that will develop software um, will come along with things. Um, but on the other hand, you know, some of the data integrity stuff that you've 
come out with, with here uh, that people have, have mentioned. You know, how much engineering effort went into making sure that Hadoop doesn't corrupt stuff and things like that? And I don't trust our software engineers to deliver systems of that technical complexity. Um, I trust the teams at Google or wherever who are paying serious teams of people rather than graduate students to, to do that. Um, so I think that's you know, part of the lesson from, from my environment. Um, so you know, I'm still relatively conservative. You know, use what you know, exploit what you can, um, but make sure that you can you know, scale by at least an order of magnitude above what people say that they want to do because by the time they're actually doing it, they'll want to do more. Last question. With Google. Um, so you mentioned virtual machines. Uh, how about uh, Amazon virtual machines? Could they feel you any? Okay, so how about Amazon virtual machines using those? Uh, okay, so this is an ongoing interesting battle, and again, I'm on the conservative side here. Um, you know, if you look at, and this is partly through my work about building data centers. You know, I've seen these people build data centers. They're looking for 10-year return of investment on their, their capital. Um, they've bought their boxes. You know, they're trying to recoup money on systems from you know, what they've got. We, on the other hand, only renew our data centers every 30 years, and we're cheapskates. Um, so our boxes are going to be cheaper per you know, delivery system. I've actually got a presentation on here which does show that. Somebody who gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago um, showed that for a given um, computing problem, Amazon was a factor of 10 on uh, more expensive than their local university. So you know, it's not just me that says that. On the other hand, you, know, you have the opportunity cost that if you want to analyze data now because you've got a conference next week and there's this resource sitting out there in terms of Amazon um, that you can exploit to, to do that. And if you don't do it, you're not going to be the first to publish. Then, you know, yeah, this is a resource that people should exploit. And people have demonstrated that the technology um, is there and are looking at links between the um, systems to, to do that. Automating it will be interesting. Again, this presentation I said a look at, you know, Gartner says that Cloudburst is, you know, a good way away from the um, productivity plateau uh, and some of the things that they say there. Um, but we can do that. Another interesting problem, though, if you look at this, uh, going to Amazon explicitly, I mentioned I was at a conference in, um, in February and the, the, the guy behind EC2 came along to that. Um, I asked him, well, the big problem for us is, you know, we've built this system so that we know where the data is and we can send it to, to that. We don't know where your CPU nodes are relative to where we'll put your data. Um, and if you could arrange so that you do that, uh, then it would be more interesting for us because we wouldn't have to pay huge amounts to send data between, you know, different Amazon centers. He said, yeah, you're absolutely right. Wait three months and I'll give you an announcement on that. It's six months and I haven't heard the answer. So, yeah, you know, it's technology. We will definitely be exploited for the opportunity cost. I don't believe, as a model, it will ever fundamentally address the, the large-scale computing provision that we have just because the cost model is different and because the optimization things are different. But being able to exploit it so you can produce a paper tomorrow, yes, you know, that will definitely be done, and that people are doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Speaker, everyone, yeah. again. Okay, thank you. Thank you.